All right, I think you go ahead. Go ahead, start. Okay. Um, so I'm Kristen, and this is Rufus, and we wanted to talk about light today. Um, and I'm, Shannon is joining me, which I'm excited about. And before we get started, I heard some exciting news that the rover got named at the planetarium, and it got named Calypso, right? Yep, it's Calypso. It's named after a screech owl that passed away due to health re reasons at the Harris Nature Center. And that was named by uh, Mia Lyons. So her, her name choice got chosen um, by the public. So congratulations to Mia. And it's a great way to honor Calypso from the Harris Nature Center. So we'll get the name up on the rover's display here uh, once we reopen. Are you gonna put a picture of a screech owl up too? Are you gonna picture? We, we might, we might. We'll, we we'll we'll talk to the Harris Nature Center. I'm sure. Rufus thinks that would be a great addition. A better addition would be a picture of him. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I wanted to talk about light because, like, light's very interesting because it can be both a particle and a wave. And what that really means is that we've done experiments and we've said, "Hey, light, are you a wave?" And when we do the experiment, light will be like, oh yeah, that's me, definitely a wave. And if you do an experiment and in the experiment, if you ask, hey, light, are you a particle? It'll be, oh, yep, definitely a particle. So I wanted to talk about how it's useful or like when it's useful to think of light as a wave and when it's useful to think as light as a particle. And um, so light, light is made up of all colors added together, but if you were to be able to like separate all the different colors of the light out, you would see it makes a rainbow. So I actually have my little slinky here and it's got like a lot of different colors of the rainbow, just like light. Step up. No, he doesn't want to go to his basket. Okay. Um, and what's interesting, so all of these colors mean different energies. So red light is less energetic than blue light. And thinking of light as a wave is really helpful to think of the different energies involved. So the different energies pertaining to different wavelengths, um, you can think of like Lake Michigan up. So if you're ever at Lake Michigan and it's a calm day, there will be waves, but the waves won't come very often. And they're longer waves, they're less energetic. And if it's a choppier day and the waves are more energetic, then you're gonna get more waves in a period of time because there's more energy going in. So I have, I'm gonna use my slinky. Rufus does not wanna be a slinky holder. So I'm gonna tie one end of it to the chair. There we go. So here's my slinky and I'm just gonna, can you see the slinky okay? Okay, so I'm gonna just not put very much energy into it. Ooh, this is a long slinky, okay. So you can see this is a long wave because it, I'm not putting much energy into it. So now if I shake it a lot, oh, <laughs> that's too much. Yeah. So if I shake it a lot, you can see the more energy I put into shaking it. I think if they go like this, it'll be better. The more energy I put into shaking it, the more waves I get out of it. Whereas if I just go like this, I get fewer waves that are longer. So this is kind of like red light. And this is more like blue light. So if you're doing this at home with your sleepy, um, there is a world record for how many waves, like waves you can get in a slinky at a time. So I would encourage you to try and let me know how many waves you can get out. Um, and another way that the uh, energies pertaining to color is helpful to think about is like with flames. So if you have a fire going um, or a candle, if you look in the center of the candle, there the blue light is at the center. That is the hottest because it's the most energetic. And then the orange outer regions um, are like actually a little bit cooler and less energetic. And that's why it looks like that. So, and then the other thing is that the reason why different things are different colors is because they absorb different energies. So Rufus is this nice green color and he absorbs 
the feathers absorb all of the colors except green and then they kick back the green wavelengths. So the green wavelengths that are coming to your eye are being, are the ones that are coming from the white light. Everything else is being absorbed and then the green is being sent back. Um, and so that's why we see different colors. But the other thing that's kind of cool is that tree leaves um, change colors. So what's happening like on a very simplified level in a tree leaf is the reason why they're green. My roof. roof we're going to talk about birds in a minute and Rufus is kind of excited. So he's being a little silly. Um, so tree leaves are green because they collect chlorophyll. So there's this biological mechanism in the tree leaves that basically takes in energies at green light and stores them up. And so that's what you're seeing is you're seeing their energy storehouses, the chloroplasts. And when they change colors in the fall, hey bud, why are you being so shy? Um, when they change colors in the fall, what they're actually doing is they're switching to a longer wavelength, the red wavelengths, and so they're switching to take in energies at red wavelengths to prepare for the winter. Um, so I talked a little bit, I mentioned eyes. All right, Rufus, he wants to go back to his perch. I'll be right back in one second. It's his, nap, it's his nap time right now. So he wanted to go to sleep. Um, so how your eyes work is your eyes here is a lens. So the light comes through, it reflects off of the back of your eye and then it gets sent to these series of cones and rods in your eye. And then your brain um, takes in, it says, okay, I have you know seven, um, 700 nanometers, which is the, wavelength of red light and it'll say you know like I have these coming in and then it transfers them to electrical signals in your brain so what your what your eyes are telling you is if I see 500 nanometers which is about the color of green coming in then it'll tell my brain oh that's green but everybody's cones and rods are a little bit different so people can see colors in slightly different ways because of how their brain interprets the energies coming in but the energies being given off are always the same and what's even cooler is when you go to birds, um, birds' eyes work completely differently. And they, they will see optical light, which is the colors of the rainbow, or GBIV. They see those differently than us, but they also see more colors than us. So a lot of birds can actually see an ultraviolet. So if you've ever seen a ruby-throated hummingbird fly by, and you know how they turn their heads and that light flashes? And it looks kind of iridescent to us. So other birds would see that as being ultraviolet. And um, I was reading, I have this bird book that I've been reading and they mentioned a study in there of Australian birds and all of, I think it was actually parrots and they looked at them. So the, all the parrots pretty much look the same to us. They were the same species in our eyes because we don't see ultraviolet. But when they looked at them in ultraviolet to see how a bird would see them, different birds' feathers gave off more ultraviolet light than others. And the birds that um, had more ultraviolet light were actually like healthier and better foragers. So the, in this case, the birds were kind of using the ultraviolet to select a potential mate and be like, oh yeah, you know, like you're good at finding food. You have like really nice ultraviolet feathers. Like you're a good provider, like, you know. Um, so I think that's really neat that birds can see that. But the other thing that's super cool is that a lot of hawks can actually see in infrared and they use this um, to hunt mice and like other small rodents. So what they do is um, there's actually air columns called thermals. So it's just columns of hot air. And so they will spread out their wings and they'll soar around them in circles. The air moves in a circular motion. And so the birds move in a circular motion too. And then they'll just look and when they see the heat signatures of mice moving they can see um like the path that the mouse is going to take and then they can dive and catch the mouse um so that's another thing that birds can do that we can't do because birds are awesome <laughs> um, and then another example of light as a wave is actually uh, radio waves and microwaves so if you imagine light not as well so imagine light as a spectrum okay so we have the rainbow and we can, we're gonna call the rainbow a spectrum because light is not just one color, it's a bunch of colors, it's a bunch of energies. And so blue is the highest energy of optical light. Red is the lowest energy of optical light. 
So if you go to energies above blue, you get ultraviolet, you get X-ray, and you get gamma rays. Now, if you um, go back down to red, and if you go to lower energies than red or longer wavelengths than red, you're going to get infrared, microwave, some submillimeter, and radio. And so we use radio and microwave in our everyday life. So when you're heating up your food in the microwave, what's happening is your microwave is giving off rays, like these little waves, you know, at the energy of microwaves, which is a long energy. But that happens to be the same wave, the same energy that jiggles water molecules. And so when you're microwaving your food, you're basically jiggling the water molecules in your food. And that's actually why your food can dry out a little bit in the microwave. Um, and then radio waves are the same principle, but they're even longer. They're even less energetic. So they're just very long wavelengths like this. And if you've ever had to tune your radio, mostly now um, cars do it for you. But if you ever hear, like you're not quite on the radio station, you hear it go, <sighs> so those are different radio waves that don't quite add up into a signal for you. Um, and then there, one of the most famous experiments done was called the Michelson-Morley interferometer. And it's called the most famous failed experiment. So back in about the 1920s or around then, um, people thought, okay, imagine, you know, think of like we're at the beach and you see waves. So waves are moving through the water. So they have, um, they call it propagation, right? So it's not, there's not just like a wave by itself. The wave is always moving through something. So sound waves are moving through molecules in the air. <clears throat> so they said, okay, light has to propagate through some medium. And they had this, they pitched this idea called luminiferous ether. That is very hard to say. And they said, there's some kind of like ether that's all around us that we can't really like see or detect, but light has to be moving through it. They didn't think light could just be a wave in a vacuum. And so they did this experiment and what they did is they took a laser and then they split off the laser and they made it go different directions really far and they had it recombine. And so what they said is that if um, the light is moving one way through the ether in one, you know, like a different way, then the one that's going at a different angle should be slowed down a little bit because it's not going um, like with the flow. So again, if you imagine it, you're at the beach, then the, so if you take a wave that's coming straight in and then there's a wave going off to the side, if you recombine them, they shouldn't add up. And so they tried to do this experiment and they wanted to measure the difference in the crests of the waves that were sent off in different directions. And they said that the amount that the second wave was slowed down by should like tell us properties about the ether. And they basically got null results. So their experiment failed because there was no ether and um, light moves differently than we thought. Um, but I did want to actually switch and talk about rainbows and prisms because light moves differently in different media. <clears throat> so what it means is that there, if you're in a vacuum or an outer space, there is a maximum speed at which light moves and we can measure this. And if you are in water or in glass, light moves at a different speed. So as an example, I have this um, jar of water right here. And if you take a glass of water and if you stick your hand in, you're gonna see that your fingers below the water line look different than your fingers above. I'm not sure this is the best jar for it, but here we go. So you should definitely try this at home. <clears throat> and you're gonna notice a couple of things. One is that your fingers are gonna be a little bit magnified right, they look bigger than they should. And there's also a slight angle to it. And this um, is called Snell's law. And there's something called the index of refraction that every different medium has. And it is a law saying that more or less that like if you stick your fingers in the light gets bent. So, <laughs> but what's cool is that the light is actually moving at a different speed in the water. And so because of that, it, all of the light is not bent equally. Um, so red light gets bent more because it's less energetic. Blue light gets bent less because it's more energetic. And again, you know, one way to think about that is that something that has less energy is easier to move. You know, like, so if it's moving like this, it's easier to bend it. But if it's going like this, 
you're going to have to do a lot more with it than you would the red light. But what I'm excited about is how this relates to rainbows. So rainbows are made when water hits one droplet of rain. And what happens is, is that it'll come in at an angle and it has to be a certain angle. I had to calculate this for a class, but the light has to come in at a certain rainbow or a certain angle and then it'll hit the back of the raindrop. It gets reflected off the back of the raindrop and then it gets bounced back out. And when it leaves the raindrop, it gets bent back. And in the process of getting bent, it gets split. And so that splitting is exactly what a prism does. Um, but that splitting happens because the light moves at a different speed in the glass or in the raindrop. And you actually need a ton of um, raindrops to make a rainbow. But um, something else interesting with the rainbows. So the rainbows go Roy G. Biv. So the red is at the top and the blue is at the bottom of the rainbow. And the reason why the red is at the top is because the red light is the least energetic. So it gets bent the most. And so the red light gets bent up the most and then the blue light gets bent up a little and then everything else gets bent in between. So now, Remember that light can also be a particle. So I'm going to talk about light as a particle now. And light, if you think of light as a particle, light can also be split up. So that's called um, dispersion. But light can also be split up into a rainbow for a completely different reason than why the prisons and the raindrops do it. And what happens is, is if you take something like a CD, which has a bunch of different slits in it, and if you try to um, force the light through the split, the slits, it will actually, again, um, bend the light and make a rainbow. But again, the bending happens for a different reason. And one of the reasons is interesting. So we can do an experiment and like we're, I'm gonna do this right now to show how light can be a particle, but think of if you have a sieve, right? So it's a sieve is just um, something with a bunch of little holes in it. And if you imagine pouring sand through a sieve, the sand will pile up and most of the light or most of the sand is going to be at the center, but some of it will go spread around to the sides because that's how particles work. And I have a little diffraction grating. So this is my laser pointer and I have this little top for it. And this little top is kind of like a sieve for light. And so I'm going to point it at this target. So here's my target. And here's my diffraction grating. There you go. You see that okay? So what you're looking at here is I am pouring this light through a sieve. That's one way to think about it. So you can see that the patterns at the center are the brightest, but there are the same pattern is repeated at the edges and it's fainter because some of the light will fall out through the edges, the light particles. <clears throat> so this is called a diffraction grating. I can spin it too. It's very exciting. <laughs> but this does the same thing as a CD does. So I made this little experiment. It's based off of something called the double slit experiment. So I'm going to use a CD. We have Bach, but the side of the CD is the side we care about. So CDs have a ton of tiny little grooves in them. So I'm going to put this here. And then I'm going to put the computer over here so you can see the target better. No, I think closer is better. OK. So I made this target and I put, I used a uh, measuring tape and this is about 38 centimeters long. So all of the tick marks on here correspond to one centimeter. And we're gonna measure how different light gets split up differently. So I have my green laser pointer. So green is about 500 nanometers. That's its wavelength and then I don't have a red laser pointer. A lot of people have red laser pointer for, um, for their cats to play with, <coughs> but I found this uh, temperature probe, which gives off some red light. So there's my red light. And so I have, it's a little bit fancy. It doesn't need to be this fancy, but I have a mirror. So I'm gonna aim the lasers into the mirror. It'll reflect, hit the CD and the CD will put it onto the target. And I just want you to observe, so. I'm going to start with the green light there. <laughs> so you can see the diffraction pattern from the CD. All those grooves are from the CD. But 
the important thing is that the light is being split up like so and this is kind of tricky to do and get it aligned but it looks like if you measure the difference between the light dots <clears throat> falls on nine and 18 or so. So there is a difference between these of nine centimeters. Now I'm gonna try this again with the red laser. This is kind of tricky to do with the CV because the CV is round. but it falls on seven and 20, <clears throat> which is a difference of 13 centimeters. So the CD is bending the red light more than it is the green light. Now I'm gonna try to do both of them together so you can compare them side by side. Let's see, so there's a the green. Ah. I got a laser pointer in each hand and it's kind of hard because I am not left-handed. There we go. Ah. I had them lined up for just a second, but you can see that the, oops, the difference between the red dots is <clears throat> a little bit longer than the difference between the green dots. Okay. So this setup is a little bit fancy and it doesn't need to be this fancy. So we posted a link for this to make your own spectrograph. So you can take a CD and this is my spectrograph. So I have this cardboard paper tube. I made a little slit at the top. The reason why we have the slit is because we only want some light getting, we don't want a ton of light. We don't want a ton of background light because that can contaminate things. Um, you want a 45 degree slit cut in the tube right here, because the light will come in through here and then bounce off the CD to your eyes. So you need to make a little hole to look at the And then you can put your CD right here and set up. This is my spectrograph. So it does the same thing as my setup that I had here with the mirror and the CD and the target, but it's portable. And that's nice because you can take it to look at all kinds of different light. And there's an interesting question of like, <coughs> how do different um, types of light sources give off different spectra? So if you look at fluorescent light bulbs, are they gonna be different than incandescent or <clears throat> even LEDs? Um, another interesting to look at are street lamps. And so this is something you can take with you and you can drive around and look at different light sources and see if they give off different things. <clears throat> Um, but finally, I want to talk a little bit about telescopes and how we use these properties of light to look at different things. So radio, submillimeter, and microwave um, light all tends to be treated as waves and not particles. And so we actually have giant radio dishes to collect those waves, and then we add them together to look at things that give off radio. <clears throat> An example of something that gives off radio emission is actually jets from a black hole. So it's called synchrotron emission. And this is what happens when you have particles accelerating in a circular motion in a magnetic field. Um, that's one example. There's a lot of other things that give off radio emission, but that's my favorite. Um, we tend to treat optical UV, X-ray, and gamma ray as particles. And so um, a lot of like optical detectors, we actually, the same way your camera works, we actually use a very fancy camera for optical telescopes. Um, I do happen to have a bunch of lenses with me. So this is one lens. Um, we have a lot nicer lenses for telescopes, but what the lenses do is they'll collect all of the incoming light and then they'll line it up. And so it's nice because if you have a faint source and you focus it, then you can make sure you're not losing any light from the source, which is important to do when you don't have a lot of light in the first place. And then for an optical telescope, we will basically have a very, very fancy CD with very small lines that will split up the light so that we can study it. 
and then it goes after the light's been split up it goes to a camera and the camera pretty much just says okay i have this many photons of each energy um for x-rays though like we treat it the same way but x-rays can't be focused through a lens because they're so energetic that they interact differently with different objects than they than optical light does which is less energetic and the way they focus x-ray telescopes is kind of cool they have a series of um different shapes like uh there's like circles and then like cones and what will happen is the light will kind of graze the sides of the cones and be bounced into the detector but when it grazes that it loses energy but the energy loss is a equivalent to the angle it comes in at. So the detector knows, oh, I had a particle come in at such and such an angle, and therefore it must be this kind of energy photon. I'll count that. Um, I think that gamma ray observations are pretty cool. So we have some gamma ray observatories on Earth. One of them is called Hawk, which people at MSU are a big part of. And this uses Cherenkov radiation. And this takes advantage of the fact that light moves faster or like moves at a different speed in water than it does in air. And so what will happen is really energetic particles like gamma rays and x-rays can't get past our atmosphere. <clears throat> so they will interact with things in our atmosphere and have particle showers. And then the they'll lose some of their energy so they're not as damaging to us but they'll still be energetic and then those will go through these big like bathtubs of water almost like these arrays and when they hit them they will um, move really fast and they'll be moving faster than the speed of light and water and they'll give off this blue radiation called Cherenkov radiation so you should look up pictures of that because it's really cool and it's really weird um, so for gamma rays um, the kind of objects that give them off are going to be the more energetic, more massive, like black holes and neutron stars. And then black holes also tend to give off a lot of x-rays, but even our own sun can give off x-rays. So yeah, it's kind of cool. <laughs> anyway, that's all I have to say about light for now. So if you have any questions, let me know. And if not, there is this thing called astronomy picture of the day that I found. And it's really cool. Today's astronomy picture of the day is a space chicken, and I'm really excited about that. <laughs>
And I'll add to that, Nadia. So even the, we see really colorful pictures that are also uh, within the visible wavelength of light. And so if we were to just look at those um, pic those images just with our eyes real fast, the color wouldn't necessarily hit us right away through the telescope. Um, but if we look at them for a long enough time or with a telescope, uh, we can get that color a lot more easily. The telescope helps bring those colors out uh, in ways that our eyes wouldn't necessarily be able to see. So same thing, it's a lot more colorful than our eyes can really see, even in the optical. So um, that's, so it is colorful, just not, um, we just sometimes need help. <laughs> see it. All right, any other questions out there? And also, if you have more questions or if you are coming to this after we're done being live, you can post them on here. We do check, we get notifications when there are new qu uh, questions and comments. So we will come back and answer them as well. And I was going to add, if you do make your spectrograph and you take it out to look at different things, especially like um, like store signs, um, those yellow street lamps and fluorescent lights, especially those, um, post that in the comments what you see, because that's really interesting. And it can tell you a lot about what elements are making up the light source and like what's going on with the light source even. And if you feel comfortable with it, post a picture of you using your spectrograph. Show us you doing these experiments at home. We'd love to see it. Especially if you painted yours and made a nicer one than mine. <laughs> yeah. You can also decorate yours. That would be awesome. Yeah. Um, and then just to note, we have Celestial Storytime tomorrow and on Thursday. Tomorrow is Here We Are, Notes for Living on Planet Earth. And then we will have um, more meteorite information. So on Wednesday at 10 a.m., Craig will be back talking about micrometeorites and how you can go find some in your own backyard. And then uh, next Monday, we'll be back with more experimental longs. I'll be leading some using fidget spinners. So there's quite a fun things you can uh, fun things you can do with fidget spinners and also with some office chairs with adult supervision. So we'll be doing some fun things with spinning because out in space, everything spins. So we'll be doing some really fun things. So come join us um, for more virtual events coming up. All right. Bye. All right. Bye. Thank you, guys.